Hey, welcome to Genre Exposure, a film podcast. Join us as we explore the wide world of cinema, broaden our horizons one movie at a time. I'm one of your hosts, Dustin, and as usual, I am here with Jason. Hey, everyone. What's up, my man? Hanging in there. How about yourself? We're making it. We're making it through. Yeah, we're doing it. We're going we're gonna to have it our way. <laughs> Shamil, Shamil. Oh, no. no one's going to get that reference. Uh, hey, it's Valentine's Day. Love's in the air. <laughs> uh-huh. Is that what you're calling it? Well, there's all kinds of love. That's <laughs> that's true. Part of what this film taught us. It's not for me to judge. And part of what it may teach you if you decide to watch it. <laughs> um, today we are returning to the wild world of Nakatsu's Roman porno. Their big budget studio stab at doing the whole pink film thing. Um, and we're talking about Wife to be Sacrificed from 1974, directed by Masaru Kanuma. This is all Dustin's doing. This is all him. It's all in the celebration of Valentine's Day. <laughs> Aim all your angry emails at Dustin. <laughs> um, and we'll have plenty to say about that. But first, we're going to do all our usual stuff, talk about what we've been watching. I'm still minding my flu journal of stuff I watched when I was dying. <laughs> um, and you know, we are part of the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, and we love it. And there's all kinds of other cool shows out there you could be listening to, checking out, digging into... But are any of them talking about Roman porno movies? I, I don't think so. I think that's our niche on the <laughs> network, maybe. <laughs> we found our niche. Wonderful. Yeah. That's why they keep us in the basement. <laughs> uh, but you can head over there and check out all the other cool shows on our network. Show them some love. See what they've been doing. Probably some more films you've actually heard of. <laughs> God, I hope so. Otherwise, though, what have you been watching, man? Okay, all right. You told me you have a story. It's, this is kind of a story. Cool. And it's a phenomena I am curious if you've ever experienced okay. or perhaps some of our listeners have, and mm. they can share their stories. Okay, cool. All right, so one of my favorite YouTubers, um, Ryan Hollinger. Uh, he's, he's one of the one people, right? One of the what now? The thing, the show. the the. What's the show called? Red Letter Media? There you go. Okay, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. This, no. This, is, this is his own dude. This is uh, his own okay. thing. He's cool. just one guy, and he usually talks about horror films and okay, stuff. Okay, nice. Uh, you'd probably like his channel. You should check it out. I probably will not. <laughs> well, he's not an annoying you. He's, he's, <laughs> he actually has thoughtful things to say, like hopefully we do. Um, and he usually has interesting movies. Mm. Um, so he had one, um, and the thumbnail was something like... Um, Australia's forgotten found footage film. Okay. Like, oh, okay. Well, I click on this, and it's I don't want to watch the whole thing because he does go into spoilers and stuff. But it was a movie called The Tunnel from 2011. Ooh. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. I dig Australian films. I like me some found footage. I dig me some horror. I'll okay. check it out because he's usually you know recommends good movies and stuff. So it's streaming on Tubi. Cool, no problem. <laughs> hey, Tubi, it's fucking free. Um, start watching it. It's an hour and a half film, or well, an hour and 34 minutes. I am literally at the halfway mark, Didn't and think. suddenly it hits me. I have fucking seen this before. Oh. And it wasn't one of the, like, it did, it took me until this one scene to realize I had seen it before. Hmm. Has that ever happened to you? Have you gotten that far in a movie to realize that you've hmm. seen it? I don't think so. I think the closest I've gotten is like, It'll be a film I partially caught when it was on TV, mm-hmm. and so I only saw like a slice of it. Right. And then I'll see that slice again and be like, oh, memory unlock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but right. no, I don't think I've ever totally forgotten a film. Um, I think that says something about this movie Uh-oh. that I got so far into it without remembering <laughs> anything about it. I'm like, I've seen that. Like, I spent like a good 10, 15 minutes saying, I've seen this, but I don't remember it. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I saw it too, not too long. It, in my defense, it did come out in like 2011. So I may have seen it shortly after it came out. And that's been 10 fucking years, you know, or something. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, wow, that really was not worth it. But I went ahead and finished <laughs> it and everything because I didn't remember it. Um, it's not a movie I can recommend. Uh-oh. It has a really cool premise. It's all about there was this um, government operation to use this underground... Um, reservoir mm-hmm. that had like collected in these old subway tunnels that were just used. Oh. But suddenly the, the, the operation just stopped and no one knew why they spent all this money, but it just went quiet. So these reporters were like, well, we're going to go in there and find out what the fuck's going on. Mm-hmm. So that okay. actually kind of dovetailed with, um, 
End of the line. End of the line. Yeah. And Shades of Echoes back to um, was it Devil's Pass? The title that they gave that film. Oh, well, the the kids were yeah, the, the Jet Love Pass. Yeah, the Jet Love Pass. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I'm like, cool. That's a, that's a cool you know premise. I want to check this out. And yeah, I've seen it. And, and the, <laughs> you've seen it, and it was not good. It wasn't. It wasn't. They really well f- from the get go. And this is something that. I, so I I went back and watched Ryan Hollinger's video, mm-hmm. and he had basically the exact same thing if i had just watched his video first <laughs> i could have saved myself an hour and a half mm-hmm. but i didn't want any spoilers but yeah he, he had the same criticisms that i had mainly the film starts with two of the four actors two of the four characters that go in to the underground area are at the beginning of the movie doing a this is what happened Ooh, like okay. a mockumentary type yeah thing. so you know they make it <laughs> so there's no fucking tension whatsoever with them right and it's just a complete misstep from the beginning. It's just, it's a waste. And it's it one of those ones where you need the title cards. It's like, this footage was recovered by the local law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, don't do the mockumentary thing. Yeah. Um, or at least don't have the people who survived at the very beginning. <laughs> and the, the location they used was really cool. It looked like some real old abandoned tunnels and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm into that. Yeah, there were some nice claustrophobic shots. It had such potential, and it was just mm-hmm. wasted wasted sad times yeah it was a very frustrating watch and i haven't been watching a lot of movies lately so that's the only one i have to talk about unfortunately wow okay but i can i will say this have i talked about the new true detective yet night country i don't i don't think we have on air no okay well um that's almost i think it's only got two episodes left Mm -hmm. and i recommend it highly it's quite good if you like the first season of True Detective, you'll really dig on this. Yeah, that's what I was holding off to see if it was more season one-ish or... It's more or season one-ish. Was. There's more of that possibly occult supernatural stuff happening. Cool. I, I, yeah, I'm really some, into that. Yeah, and there's some callbacks to the first season, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So. The first season was like gold. Yeah. Yeah, and this one has like serious like the thing vibes and stuff just because Ooh. of the setting and some imagery. and It's cool. Yeah, I, I've seen reception online seems kind of mixed on it, and I'm surprised because I thought like Jodie Foster in the mix, like yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what people's complaint is about this. I don't know what it could be, hmm. other than that it happens to feature two women. I don't know if that's their issue. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know how some people are. Yeah, there are a contingent <laughs> of the internet that if it's if it's chicks, they don't care. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, hmm. I don't. I don't know what I don't. I, I don't know what anyone's complaint could be about this season. It's very good. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, check it out, but don't check out the tunnel. It's free, but don't do it. I mean, don't. it's on Tubi. There's worse things. There's better things. You could be watching Chompy and the Girls. <laughs> you could be. At least you might remember that. <laughs> You're probably not going to get halfway through that and be like, "Oh wait, I think I've seen this." <laughs> Okay, man. So what have you got? Okay. What have you been watching? Um, I'm going to rattle through several because I'm trying to clear this out. Okay. This is more of my flu season. Oh, God, I'm dying. I must watch all these films really quick. Uh-huh. Um, so I think first, I want to talk about Pearl. Oh, yeah. So um, if you remember, I was kind of mixed on X. There was stuff I liked about it, but there was a lot of things I was like, mm, I don't know about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially the whole like old, ooh, old people are scary angle. <laughs> old people are scary. <laughs> okay, old people can be scary, mm-hmm. as as can young people. As sure. ca- as can all people. Sure. Um, Anything can be scary. Nothing's off the table. <laughs> I don't think this movie is saying that all old people are scary. These uh, particular murderous old people <laughs> are scary. So I uh, I delayed watching Pearl because I was like, meh, I don't know. Finally watched it because I, I I'm intrigued about um, Maxine the yes, final part. Yes, and I was like, well, I got I got to go through it all then if I'm gonna do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so Pearl, I'm gonna say, fucking loved it, dude. Yeah. Like, really liked it. That's good. Loved loved the tone. Loved that it tried to have that kind of like retro vibe going on, mm-hmm. especially with the colors. They tried to almost make it be like it was Technicolor or yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, very like Wizard of Oz ish effects. Mm-hmm. Um, and just. The Pearl character, her the younger version of her that Mia Goth plays is like... She's great. So charming and so interesting and yet so deranged. Yeah. And it's like, they flush her out enough that like you understand the why to everything. And it doesn't make it okay, but it's still like intriguing and you want to see where it's going to go. Um, 
Also, just fucking props. Like, one of the big subplots in the film is this whole, like, there's going to be, like, this dance rehearsal thing for, like, a troupe to go around and do, like, performances. Right. And she she really wants to get that because she thinks she's a good dancer and she could just finally leave the farm and, you know, have this life of travel and adventure. Um, and when it finally comes to her audition, during her performance, it, like, breaks into this whole, like, musical segment that's this crazy, like, overblown, like, <laughs> the Great War reference where it's, like, she's on just a stage but then the stage gives away and it's like the trenches of Europe mm -hmm. and there's people in gas masks behind her dancing as backup dancers and stuff and it was just fucking amazing. That's great. Uh, I really, really loved it. Probably the only criticism I can give is I felt like it ends in a weird point. It's sort of building up to like her, her betrothed who's away in the war coming home and it really stops on like just right when he arrives. Right. And um, I don't know, I feel like there's still a gap between like where it stopped and where they are in X, that it was like... Well, I think you got the sense yeah. that he was... Even all the stuff that Pearl does, he's still like yeah. devoted to her. You mm -hmm. know, And that's where we find him in the beginning of X. So right. it's... I, it didn't bother me, but I see what you mean. Um, but props to it for continuing the A24 trend of the last shot just being the main character smiling... <laughs> maniacally. Maniacally and kind of unsure whether this is a good or a bad thing. <laughs> Um, so I love that. I saw the meme of like all of those ending uh -huh. shots together, and I was like, "Dude, that's fucking awesome!" Yeah. Um, next, I'm going to move on to Saw X, okay, franchise that's very near and dear to my heart, as you will know if you're a regular listener. Um, this is their stab to kind of like reinvigorate the franchise a little bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, as you know, for like the last two or three films, they've kind of stumbled with like, "Oh, we're going to set up a new apprentice or a new copycat kind of thing to carry on the legacy." I'll take your word for it. Uh, it's never really gone anywhere. <laughs> uh, and so with Saw X, we're actually jumping back to the point between the first Saw and Saw 2. The sort of interquel that's going to flesh out the plot a little bit. I need like a flow chart or something, man. Uh, I can make you one. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> and so, of course, the big tilt of doing this is like, oh, we can bring back in Tobin Bell. Sure. Have John Kramer. He's great. Um, they, they clearly did, had no idea what they were on when they got to the third one. Decided, like, well, let's kill him. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that made a good narrative arc for those first three films. Yeah. And then they were like, fuck, we have the biggest horror franchise of all time right now. <laughs> what do we do now? And then ergo, the many, many sequels of everybody struggling to be the next Jigsaw. Um, and so, yeah, this one, like, it's weird because it, when it starts, it's almost more of like a drama that's just about John Kramer. Mm -hmm. And it's just him, you know, he's dealing with that terminal diagnosis of cancer and he's looking into different avenues and there's no real answers. And there's a great fucking like opening trap kill. They do um, like set up where it's like, he's at the hospital for a visit, a check-in and he notices like one of the nurses is like stealing from an elderly patient. That's like right on death's door. And then he like makes a point to stalk that guy, abduct him and then put him through a trap to test him. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Which is like a great, great open. But then, yeah, for a long time, you're kind of just with John going through this. And the big hook of it is he meets, like, someone that was with one of the, like, cancer groups he was in. And he appears to be, like, totally in remission. He says he took this experimental treatment. Um, it's so radical and new that, like, the FDA is not wanting to authorize it in America. So you kind of have to go overseas to get it done. Uh, but 100% success rate, any kind of cancer, they can wipe it out. It's just so experimental and so radical that people aren't wanting to accept it. Uh -huh. And so kind of, you know, looking for the end, that last shred of hope, he goes in on it, flies down to Mexico, goes through this whole procedure. And as you might expect, it turns out to be a complete and total fraud. Right. And when he realizes sort of the depths of what they're doing, that they're scamming these people that are like right on death's door, it's like, you know, it's on. Okay. Jigsaw's got to teach them a lesson. All right. And then that becomes the thrust of the film. Cool. Um, it was super fun, super clever. Cool to have the like Mexico setting for the film. Mm -hmm. um, it made the traps interesting because it's like he didn't have his full like base of resources. Like he calls for Amanda, she comes down there to help him. Great to have Shawnee Smith yeah. back in the mix again. She's fun. Um, they bring in Detective Hoffman. He doesn't come, but he's sort of like off screen researching all the people they're trying to abduct and getting all the information since he has the police connections. Um, but the traps are more like. They're a little more raw, like the early films, where it's like mm -hmm. he's kind of just building them by hand. Not crazy elaborate. Yeah, and they're not like super industrial constructions. Mm. Um, but yeah, I just really liked it. It was super fun. It does this really neat twist where like 
the antagonist kind of gets the upper hand on them and flips the situation. And kind of one of the big climax parts of the film is like the final trap he had planned for like the main antagonist. She gets like some people that comes in and helps her and they flip everything. And so they put John into that trap Mm. to see if he will survive it. Mm -hmm. And then he has to kind of deal with one of his own contraptions uh, to save himself. Which I guess it's a little muted because you know he's going to survive. But um, there's some other factors in the mix I I won't spoil that there is a lot of tension there. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, really super fun. Super loved it. Seems like Eleven we're keeping in that area with more John Kramer. So Okay. Um, Do wish they would try to move forward, but also not going to complain about more Tobin Bell. I always threaten, because I stopped at three. Uh I always threaten to go back and rewatch all of them. Oh, dude, it's a hoot. And just... See what happens to my brain after that. Um, I do think there is a space to do like a story there, though. Where um, so by three we get the whole thing of like Amanda has kind of like lost faith in what they're doing, and she starts to make the traps that just kill people no matter what. Mm-hmm. So I think if, if they actually like focused on that, and maybe like her decline to yeah. reach that point, that could be cool for like a film or two. So we'll see what happens. All right. And then last but not least, and perhaps most relevant for this very year. I revisited the Purge franchise <laughs> for the real Purge, the Forever Purge. Oh God! Most recent mm-hmm. one, 2021, directed by Vardo Gout. This is the one, as you know, where it was very, very. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, right wing politics unhinged and unchained. Oh, and okay. and the the deep seated fears that probably many people have. So it was. Um, it was prescient is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, very prescient. Um, but yeah, it, it's finally bringing us back to like advancing the plot because if, you, if you're if you a Purge franchise fan like me, you know that um, our last forward motion was election year where they actually got in a president that opposed the Purge and they were trying to abolish that. So Forever Purge picks up where that's kind of backslid. She didn't win re-election. They've got someone else in. The Purge is back. But the purge isn't enough anymore. There's a there's a weird contingent of America that thinks that one night isn't enough every year. So <laughs> in the annual purge that happens in the film, it, it does its thing. It's kind of just the intro of the film. They just don't focus on it too much. They focus on some of the characters and how they're locking themselves down in places. Um, it's set in Texas. It's kind of focused on this family of like very rich, well-to-do white people that own a ranch. And then several immigrants from Mexico one of which works at the ranch and very other pla- various other places in the town. And it sets up a neat dichotomy of like the ranchers have the whole setup of like the first film where they paid for all this security system to lock down their house. And then the, um, the other family that have immigrated there, they have to go to like a public shelter right. to wait out the purge. Hmm. And so it's cool to see like the dichotomy of that and, yeah. and how that works. Um, Cause they're basically just like kind of in like the lunchroom at a school and there's people that have been hired to come there with guns to protect it in case anyone goes at it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but then the big twist of the film is that the next day, this militant contingent all around America swarms up that wants there to be an endless purge until they remove all of the things infecting America from it. Okay. Um, yes, and it gets very... Um, hmm. I'm trying to choose my words carefully here as I discuss this. <sighs> To not offend anyone too much, but well, it's, um, you know, sometimes you know, satire becomes reality. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's what I want to say about the film. It felt uh, it felt a little too real, yeah, it was a little too hot. But um, it was fun. It was enjoyable. Um, there's some good character development among the survivors as they kind of band together, and and the ultimate twist of it is that like, it's very scary because it's like a large scale thing where it's like in every state, there's like a contingent of this group, and they've coordinated. And, like, planned everything to, like, hit military installations first and try to, like, disable any form of, like, the government mounting a response. Mm. So it gets, like, way out of hand. And in response to that, Canada and Mexico open their borders. And it's like, if anyone can flee to us, you know, we'll give you amnesty. You can come in. We'll keep you safe for the time being. So, like, the crux of our core cast is they're just trying to make it to the border in time to get across before everything gets, like, super totally locked down. Okay. Right. And in the course of doing so, all the usual purge antics ensue with weird people in masks and maniacs and crazy stuff. So you'd recommend it? It was super fun, dude. Yeah. I haven't seen them after the second one. It, um, If you liked Anarchy, that second one, it kind of has, I think, the closest vibe to that one. Mm, okay. 
I did enjoy the second one. Just with a healthy dose of like crazy white dudes wrapping themselves in American flags and going down the street. Yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about a former president now? What are you doing? <laughs> I mean, they made the film. I'm just commenting on what I saw. So, uh, hmm. Yeah, there you go. Got a few more films. We'll save those. Yeah, save those for later. Day. We gotta get to the main course here. We do. Oh, do we do? Right, so today we are talking about Wife to be Sacrificed from 1974, directed by Masaru Kanuma. My selection for you all for <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, just to get a bunch of this out of the way up top, I think we need to give our usual disclaimer that this is a transgressive film. Yes. It can be a difficult film. Um, there is, you know, depictions of, of rape, of sexual humiliation... Uh, varying degrading acts. Yes. Um, so not like, for the squeamish. Not, not for the for squeamish. The easily offended. Yes. And like we always say, we take every film on its uh, on its own, but know yourself, know your limits, know what you're cool with. If you don't think that's the kind of movie you want to be watching, you just listen to us rant about it for a bit, and you don't need to subject yourself to it. And just keep repeating to yourself that it's, it's only, only a movie. movie. <laughs> um. So, I'm not going to go over much of what pink film and Roman porno is because we have done that extensively. Uh, if you want to get deep in on what a pink film is, you can go back <laughs> to one of our earliest episodes, Inflatable Sex Doll of the Wastelands. We did a good overview breakdown there. And then last year, we did a trilogy of films in a little block all about the Nikatsu Roman porno line. Um, but just to be super succinct, pink films <laughs> are sort of indie, outside of the studio system, made erotic cinema from Japan. They often have different formulas and rules that they tend to follow. Many, many of that is that they tend to be sh pretty short, usually like an hour, a little over. Um, and the Roman porno series from Nakatsu was their attempt to do the big budget cash-in on that, pump the studio money in there, because like all good things, just like horror films, they found out that you could make these for super cheap, and oh, did they gross a lot of money. <laughs> yep. Horror and... Um, it's not really porno. Smut. Horror smut. and smut. Yes. Always, always rakes in the dough. And in particular of those earlier episodes, I think if you wanted to go for just one, probably Flower and Snake, because this film has a ton of connections and through lines there in its sort of production. I think I will I will cover just this little slice of it. So okay. um, if you want the in-depth, you can go back for it. But in 1971, theatrical audiences had been moving on toward television. And Nakatsu, one of Japan's oldest major film studios, had entered into the softcore pornography genre that was previously dominated by independent pink film studios. They did this in a desperate effort to avoid bankruptcy. The move had proven highly successful for the studio for about three years, but by 1974, again, profits were dwindling and they had another difficult year charted out ahead. For years, they had been trying to recruit Naomi Tani, known as the Queen of Pink. She had been famed for many of the pink films she had shown up in. And particularly in the S&M genre, which had been something that Nakatsu had been a little hesitant to get into. Because even as studios kind of tried to rake off this style... That was something they didn't know if they wanted to get in with. But every time they requested her, that was her specialty. That's the kind of film she wanted to make. And so she would turn them down. So finally, they put together the ultimate pitch to get her and requested her to star as the leading lady in a film based on Oniroku Don's S&M novel, Flower and Snake, that we covered last year that mm -hmm. came out in 1974, directed by the same director, Masaru Kanuma. And it became one of their biggest hits, exceeding many of the prior Roman porno films they had made. It's quite a movie. Quite a movie. Really not what you think it's going to be either. Uh, and it was so successful, they immediately were like, we need more of these now. 
now, now, now. Mm-hmm. And so almost immediately, Wife to be Sacrificed got put into production. Kanuma back in the director's chair. Um, Oniroku Don kind of set out at first. He wasn't really happy with the way that Flower and Snake was handled. And you can go to our episode on that if you want more details. But um, they made this one without his involvement. Though later he did kind of come around and give his uh, exclusive rights to his novels to Nakatsu to work on. And then ultimately, and we'll we'll get to this maybe a little more as we talk about the film, but Wife to be Sacrificed became Nakatsu's biggest hit in 74. And it remains as one of their top five most successful films of all time. It's pretty crazy. So, and these movies are uniquely Japanese. They I are. Mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a parallel like this in any other country. I mean, it's even the kind it's, of it's like interesting soft core erotic cinema of America. It's not. It's different. Yeah, the right? themes are completely, yeah. completely different. So let me hit you with. A little synopsis. A wife charges her husband with sexual battery. He escapes from the police and goes into hiding. Three years later, she divorces him and tries to put the pieces of her life back in order when suddenly he returns. Obsessed with rage and hatred, he kidnaps her and brings her to a house in a remote wooded area. There he disciplines her, subjecting her to increasingly shocking forms of sexual torture. Astonishingly, through the rage and lust, the pair develop a relationship that pushes the boundaries of lurid passions and perverse obsessions. Mm-hmm. That's a good what, way of putting it. Succinct. What a great synopsis. <laughs> Doesn't that just intrigue you to want to watch the film? Well. No, just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the movie opens with a woman walking. She's got an umbrella, mm-hmm. a white umbrella, and she's wearing like a traditional kimono. And she stops on the street, and she sees a man in a parked car. Yep. And this man is watching a little girl down by the river, relieving herself. Uh huh. Um, he sees her, and says, "What is her name?" Akiko. And she hurriedly walks past the car. And he's kind of getting out and watching after her, and that little girl comes up to him and calls him uncle. And ask what he, what he's doing. Yeah. And he says, yeah, it's, it's not her uncle. Spoilers. Spoilers. Um, he said he was looking at that at that woman, and because you know he, he thinks she's pretty, and the little girl calls him a nasty man. Mm-hmm. Says something about how I didn't think you liked older women. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> this is a hard fucking movie to talk so, about. So so let's stop right here. I want to ask you this because it was a thought that was very uh, preeminent in my mind. <laughs> When they shot this, well, first let's say in the credits, they don't credit the little girl. <laughs> Rightly so. Uh, the second thing is, so when they shot this, do you, how much do you think they told the kid of what was happening? Nothing. To, yeah, nothing, I'm sure right? They told Surely. The kid nothing. Yeah. I mean, how are they going to explain it to a kid? <laughs> yeah. The kid, the kid doesn't need to know anything. You uh, know? It just made me like, I want the behind the scenes of like when they shot this. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems fucking weird. It's very weird. It's very weird. Um, and then we get almost like a hard cut. Mm-hmm. And then it's the little girl w- running through town crying. Yeah, she looks like she's abandoned now. Yeah, saying her uncle has disappeared. And Akiko sees her and, and tries to comfort her. And a cop comes up. And and uh, the man who was in the car with the girl is also like watching from, yeah, he's, he's from spying afar. On him. Yes. Which Akiko is played by Naomi Tani. Yes. And, uh, and she's great. Just she's like amazing. she was in Flower and Snake. She really, she really gives it her all in this movie. <laughs> uh, she goes through a lot, for sure. And she's a trooper. But she just has such a great like screen presence. Like It just radiates the moment she's on, mm-hmm. on screen. Um, so then we're, we're with Akiko in her home. And she's giving uh, Ikebana. Yeah, Ikebana. Which is flower arranging. Yes. Which goes way back in the Japanese culture. And it's very cool, too. Yeah. I mean, even samurai would do this. Mm-hmm. It was something they were, they were well versed in. It, it was considered like a cultured thing to be able to, mm-hmm. to do. So already we've gotten a couple of nods to like traditional ancient Japanese past. Mm-hmm. Like with 
her dress and, and her activity that she's doing. I think I think that's important. I think they're trying to say something. I think so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we can we can put a pin in that and go on. Yeah. Um, so the police come and he's asking her questions. Turns out her estranged husband, uh, Kunisada, which was the guy she saw in the car. Mm-hmm. Played by Nagatoshi Sakamoto, yeah, he's who great. also plays her husband in Flower and Snake. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. He's, he, he plays a type. He's typecast. <laughs> this guy's um, a little more hardcore than the Flower and Snake guy, though. Yeah, he is. So we get some of the backstory you alluded to in your uh, synopsis. Yeah, he left three years ago because he was involved in a scandal. He was a school teacher. Yep. And he was involved in a scandal with a uh, young girl. Mm-hmm. But he fled, and they've not been able to track him down since. Yep. And this cop has some more information on that little girl we saw in the beginning. Her name's Miko. Yep. And um, she wasn't lost. That wasn't her yeah, uncle. Yeah, he abducted her. Yeah, he was, she was abducted and had been sexually assaulted, as you may have inferred already. Yeah, did, we, did we give a trigger warning for this? We did. We, we did. <laughs> <laughs> if, if not, now's the time. Yeah. <laughs> Run. <laughs> So, uh, Akiko is at a graveyard where her husband appears. Yeah, she's there. Uh, her mother died recently. Mm-hmm. So, she's there to kind of say a prayer, show her respects. And he shows up and he pays his respects to her mother. And it's weird because it's like, we have the background. Like, he's been gone for three years. He's wanted by the police. She turned him in. And he just shows up. Yeah, and he, he just shows up. He's like, let me pay my respects to your mother. <laughs> yeah. It's, he's not, like, taking any difficulty. Any, any. He's not trying to disguise himself or anything. He's mm-hmm. just... Roaming around. Um, she, he asks her why she never remarried. And she says that she hates men now. Yep. She's decided that she hates men. And he admits that he's scared of women. Which is maybe why he's hanging out with Miko. I don't know. <laughs> one one may make such an assumption. <laughs> um, And then he just kind of starts to walk off. And she's sort of being like, what's... What's going on here? Mm-hmm. And then it's like he he grabs her hand, right? Yeah, he says, "I got something for you." He's got a gift. He's got a he goes. He says, "I got a gift for you." And it's it's like a little miniature lock almost that fits around her finger. Yeah, it's kind of like a ring, but not. It's like a ring with a clasp and everything, yeah. and it's got like a chain to it. <laughs> so yeah, he just clasps her finger in this, and now he's got her um, hooked. Like she can't get it off, and he's leading her around with it. It made me think of Star of David. The other, the third one we covered. Oh yes, where he had like the weird like torture trap devices. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so then he's got her in his car, and she's telling him that he's wanted by the police. Uh, you know, don't do this; it's gonna make things worse. And he says something about how he, he's expecting the worst. That's what he wants. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he takes her to this old abandoned house. It said where it's where he was keeping Miko, he tells her. Yeah, it's, it's out in the countryside. It's been abandoned for a long time. It's kind of just no one knows it's there. Yeah. He thinks it's great. <laughs> he would. <laughs> um, so that night, he's got her there during the night, and um, basically she's like, okay, if you if you promise to let me go, she, she basically lets him have sex with her or, or begin to. Yeah. Uh, but he's not really into just having because her deal is kind of like we can hook up you let me go i won't tell anyone yeah we can go our separate ways but he's not interested in such a conventional (laughs) transaction no no he's not but i'll say kunisada he's not the sort of uh rope master that we had in flower and snake well he's he's pretty good at making knots we find out pretty good but it's not as intricate as (laughs) flower and snake (laughs) Um, but yeah, he binds her hands, mm-hmm. and there's a candle burning nearby, which he takes and uses upon her. Let's uses say upon her, yes. Uh, so later on, she's still tied up, and she's like, "Oh, you lied to me." <laughs> yeah, no shit. Which, by the way, speaking of the candle, again, like one of the interesting things about these is that again, they had to be very careful with how they shot scenes and how they framed things. Right, because you could not show genitalia in right. Japanese cinema. Which is still true today. Right. Um, it's amazing. So that's probably one of the reasons, and I think we've mentioned this before, why their stuff is so fucking weird sometimes. <laughs> because they have to like compensate for that. Mm-hmm. You know, it can't just be conventional, normal, <laughs> softcore pornography. They've got to up the ante. Yeah. 
So there's this one shot. I think it's either here or it's the next time they have sex. But there's like a long shot of, of them getting it on. And they frame it so that the candle is like right, right. near their waist. And the flickering flame is what's blocking out uh-huh. their genitalia. It's actually, it's very artistic. And yeah, it's very well framed. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of good blocking going on here. <laughs> Which I want to say, on that note, uh, the cinematography was Masaru Mori. Mm. He was also the cinematographer on Star of David. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was a good-looking movie. Um, yeah, because later on they would just like put in fogs, optical fogs. Yeah. They, would, they wouldn't bother with the blocking and things like that. Uh, so she's kind of all trussed up. She's forced to eat like a dog out of bowls of food. Yeah, well, she resists eating for a long time. Yeah. And he, he keeps like teasing her about it and saying, like, oh, you're going to have to eat or you're going to lose your strength. Yeah, you can't, you can't go on too long without eating. Um, so he's kind of lurking in the shadows and watching her as she's tied up, attempting to use the bathroom in this nearby bowl. Yeah. But he ain't having that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is probably like the film's most notorious scene, I would say. This from, is from pretty infamous. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he takes her because he doesn't want to do anything in front of him. She stops and, but he leads her out to this outhouse out back. The old outhouse out the back. Yeah, and watches her do her business, which they briefly show. Um, it's like almost like a John Waters movie all of a sudden. Yeah, and it's it's supposed to be sort of like a humiliation thing. But um, I have a little quote about this. So um, it's a very fleeting shot. And of yeah, course it's, they like, had, it's like a sixth of a second or something. And they had to make a prop for that, of course, too, which is funny to think about them like, how do we design this? <laughs> Um, but let's see. Um, yeah, so that um, that scene is considered the most controversial scene of the film. Um, and about that shot, Tani commented later in an interview, um, back then it was a big deal. It was so shocking to depict that on film. And actually what they shot was longer than what is in the movie. And they made Kanuma cut it down to just a single one-second shot originally into just four frames or one-sixth of a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a very famous uh, kind of documentary interview thing where they got Hideo Nakata to interview Konuma about his films and his work. I think Nakata's a big fan of his. And when they were talking about it, what Konuma wanted to get into was the color they made the prop. It is odd. And here's the quote. Um, Nakata like asked him about it, and then Konuma replied, I made it like that. I thought a beautiful woman's turd should be thick and brightly colored. That's the imagery I wanted to shoot onto film. <laughs> I don't like the kink shame, you know. I don't. I don't like to yuck people's yum. That's just fucked up, man. Ah, oh, bless this man. <laughs> <laughs> He's a maniac, no doubt. Mm. <laughs> so later on, she's bathing, cleaning up after mm. this, and she's got like this noose. Tightly tied around her neck, so she can't really get free. But she's got like a small knife or a razor. Yeah, she got somewhere. It's conveniently just laying around because this place is like a dumpster pile. True. Uh, so she's kind of like cutting at the rope some, but then um, her husband, ex-husband, comes back in, and he, he cut. She, she cuts him. She yeah. gets him a couple slices across it, the face. It's funny because his back's to her at first, and she's just like, "Well, whatever." Slash, and then he spins around. Yeah, and he's kind of like, "What happened?" And then she just rakes him across the face with it. All right. And uh, she runs outside, tries to make a run for it, but he's too fast and catches her. Mm-hmm. Hey, she's resourceful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What can you say? But this attack of hers um, impressed him. Later on, she's, she's tied up even more, and she's surprised that her attack... He, he says... She... Well, hang on. What am I trying to say here? Hang on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, she, she, he asked if she wanted to kill him. Yeah. Which I think would be, yeah. I mean, in that situation, who wouldn't, right? And then he gets a big piece of bamboo, kind of hog ties her to it. Mm-hmm. It's her punishment for hurting him. Yes. He, he says that she's a bad woman for trying to kill her ex-husband and then starts dra- dropping hot wax all over her. A bad person yeah. for trying to protect herself. The, the candles really, really get a lot of use in this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the next day, she's tied up if we, even more knots. See, the knot work's getting more impressive. It is, yeah. Um, and she's kind of quietly cutting through her bonds again. And meanwhile, Kunisada's gone back to Akiko's house, which yeah. is where he used to live. He wants to go there to get her wedding dress. Yeah, yeah. But one of their servants were there. Which is a very odd moment. Yeah, and she just says, oh, hello, master. You're, you're back or whatever. <laughs> and he seems so happy at this. He's like, oh, hey. You're still here. <laughs> but, and going to do that, because they are in a remote location, so mm-hmm. it takes a while. Right. It gives Akiko plenty of time to get free of her bondage and mount an escape. <laughs> yeah, she's running through the forest. She's wearing a raincoat. Mm-hmm. Um, and she comes upon a couple of hunters and is like pleading for help. Um, but they just look at her leeringly and immediately begin assaulting her. Yeah. As often happens in these types of movies. Yeah, it's a bit of a last house on the left kind of kind of vibe to it. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a nice bit on your grave. One situation worse to the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's probably the closest American films have gotten to be like in this range, I think. Right. Uh, it's, there's kind of, it's almost a funny scene because she's got these elaborate knots all over her the rope and stuff and they can't get to her yeah so they're just cutting through them with a big hunting knife it's like I'm, I'm not I'm never sure how seriously to take these movies so I know when we did Flower and Snake we talked about how there were actually a lot of comedy in that yeah and I want to say this one's more serious but I also think there's a few moments where it is kind of trying to be kind funny of a, kind of a black comedy even, even if very blackly so hmm Especially there's a scene later that I'll talk about that um, they, they had to be playing a joke. I don't see how they couldn't be, but, okay. but we'll see. See what you think. So Kunisada's on his way back, and he finds Kiko laying unconscious in the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, no sign of the hunters. They're gone. So he just brings her back to the abandoned house, and she's now hanging from the ceiling this time, tied up in her wedding clothes. But in the build-up to that, too, also, he like cleans her up, which yes. is surprising. yes. Well, he wants her to look good for the wedding night because he says they, he wants to get remarried to her. Yeah. <laughs> it's apparently, I don't know, I wrote in my notes, it's just like a tradition, a Japanese tradition, because he wants to get married again, but he then forcibly shaves her privates. <laughs> it's like, is this something you have to do? Uh, I think that's just a kuni, kunisada <laughs> thing, you know? Um <laughs> But yeah, this is very like this is where it gets to the super elaborate levels where it's like they have the police. Uh, it's like in the latter parts of Star of David where she's yeah. suspended in the air. Um, and you get into the interesting like framing of scenes and the way she is like posed and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he says something how you're truly naked now, and starts assaulting her again. But she also kind of seems to be getting into it now. Yeah, as so often happens in these movies. <laughs> And then we kind of get a jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This scene is very strange at first. It's, until you kind of realize what, what's going on. Yeah, it's super, super weird. So Kunisada is out fishing. Which I, which I answered a question I was wondering, which is like, how do they live up there? Because he, he does have food sometimes. Yeah. But I was like, you I just... I thought like he was just going to town and getting supplies every now and then. I guess, but... I, but, I mean, catch your own fish. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Live in a shack. Abduct your <laughs> wife. Catch, catch your own fish. fish. <laughs> but he happens upon these two young, nicely dressed people mm-hmm. laying kind of like on this ledge next to the river, just unconscious. Yeah. Trying to commit suicide. Yeah. We see like some like pill bottles or something yep. sticking up out of her purse. And he just immediately begins assaulting the unconscious woman. Well, to be fair, he, he inspects her first. <laughs> Let's not sell this guy short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we wouldn't want to discredit him or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obvious these young people have decided to commit some sort of double suicide. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, their parents didn't approve of their relationship. Who knows? We never find out. But speaking of worse situations, crashing into worse situations, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he has his way with the woman. Who we later learn is named Kaoru. Mm-hmm. Played by Tarumi Azuma, which she has some other credits, but I'll get into that later, okay. I think. And then the dude is Kiyoshi, played by Hidetoshi Kageyama. Yeah, and he manages to get them both back to the house. Which, they don't show us that part. No. I was, I was like, hmm. Yeah, that'd take a while. <laughs> uh, so he's got 
Um, Keru all trussed up. And he's talking about how the girl had true love on her face yeah. when he found her. And she wakes up. She's asking for Kiyoshi. And she kind of begins to cry. She realizes what's going on. A natural reaction. And Kiko says something. He, she says, why don't you just go ahead and die? Because otherwise you're going to have to live with the shame. Yeah. <laughs> just like, whoa. Yeah. Where, where'd that come from? Oh, and I guess I guess actually he just took the girl back. Because Kiyoshi kind of shows up at the doorway. He like yeah. stumbles in. Yeah, he stumbles in. And he's still obviously under the effects of whatever drug they took. And he just collapses. And then he uh, strips him down to his underwear and ties him to one of the posts mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in the house. Yep. And Kiyoshi wakes up, tells Kunisada to stop joking around and untie uh, Keru while she's pleading for Kiyoshi not to look. Yeah, because she's embarrassed. Yes. He has her uh, posed in a way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and Kunisada says that you shouldn't be embarrassed because you two loved each other to death. You know, you're beyond embarrassment. Mm-hmm. And then he, again, as so often seems to happen in these movies, he forcefully gives her an enema. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Why am I the one describing most of this shit? This, you should be talking about this. This took me off guard. Um, Why? You've seen it in the other movie? Yeah, but I, you just never expect it, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Um, you know what? I feel sorry for you that you kind of have taken the lead on this. I'm not sure why, but um, me either. Like, I will. Inv- this is your pick, motherfucker. You should be talking about. It. In respect to you, I am gonna reveal an embarrassing fact about myself. <laughs> okay. Does that seem fitting? I can't wait. On this, the day of Valentine's. Um, so when you're when you're a young person and like you do, and at some point you discover that hentai exists, <laughs> um, you you dabble, one might say, right? Correct. Sure. Um. And so, I forget, it was some random title, you know, recommended by people. Uh, you're checking it out. It's like, oh, this is pretty steamy. This is cool. Uh-huh. And it's, you know, it's like episodes, right? Like, okay. like an anime. Uh, so you finish the one episode, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. Then you go to the next episode, and then suddenly they're giving everybody enemas. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so that did not trip your trigger, is what you're saying. Um, Do you remember what series it was? God, I want to say it was... I want to say it was Bible Black. Bible That's Black. a pretty that infamous sounds, that sounds one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, noted for both being fucking insane, but also kind of having a plot. Yeah, kind of like uh, Uratsuki Doji. Right, so. which was my introduction to hentai. Mm-hmm. Completely unexpected. I had no idea what it was, and I saw it on the big screen at the Kentucky Theater, <laughs> which is right. amazing. <sighs> interesting. Very interesting. So there we go. So, um, oh, so this is the scene though. This, this the anima scene. So, I'll, I'll talk about this because this is my in my notes to talk about. So. Um, it builds up and it builds up. They're making like a big dramatic moment of it. And so when it finally gets to the part where... Oh God, how do I want to say this? When stuff comes out. Uh-huh. Um, he makes Akiko get up there with like a bag to catch it all. Right. Which, again, is like shades of flower and snake. Uh-huh. Um, but when it... Without the sound effects. <laughs> without, without the sound effects. But when the event happens... I'm going to say the event... They put in the fucking most dramatic, over the top, like drama music swell it's stinger. It's like from a spaghetti western. Yeah, and it's like the moment where like the love interest dies. And there's been like no music yeah. up to this point. It's been very like incidental or just out of the way. Yeah. And it's just the hugest fucking like they're going to town swell. And it replaces whatever sound effects you would normally hear during it. Yeah, it like it blanks this. all of the sound effects and normal conversation. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. They have to have been making, meaning that to be funny, dude. Like, come on. Yeah, that's one of the parts that I thought was. <laughs> is, this, is this supposed to be funny? I don't know. That's yeah, great. It's wonderful. The music's amazing. Um, after that, though, now that he got whatever pleasure he derived out of that, I guess, uh, he decides to start having sex with Kaoru, and mm-hmm. he orders Akiko to have sex with Kiyoshi. Yes, who apparently... He didn't know it, but this is his thing because he's, he's visibly aroused after this happens. Um, and this is kind of like it's implied to be Kunisada's plan is that he's trying to like humiliate them and destroy the love they have between one another. Mm-hmm. And he thinks that by torturing Kaoru and making Akiko sleep with Kiyoshi, that will like break down their feelings between them. Right. Um, it's very much like. It's like he just wants to destroy the like traditional yes. idea and concept of love. Right. Which is why I fucking picked this for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Man, someone doesn't like Valentine's Day. <laughs> you should try working at a florist <laughs> on no, Valentine's Day. No thanks. 
Yeah. Uh, so after this, Akiko is like willingly and enjoyably washing her hus- ex-husband's back. Like, yeah. They're having a good time. She's uh, she's made a decision and she's decided she's into this now. Yeah, she likes it. Um, and then she's tied up outside. She's asking Kunisato to whip her. She says she's a bad woman mm-hmm. and needs to be whipped. And notably, she says, you've turned me into this. Mm-hmm. And then he says, no, this is always who you were. Yeah. Yeah. You Which just denied it. Seems to be another uh, recurring theme in these movies. Mm-hmm. Same for Flower and Snake. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess the traditional, typical Japanese repression probably has something to do with this, too. You know, how they are very much like, I mean, they don't believe in being emotionally exuberant in front of others. You know, they're very quiet. You know, like if you go on a Japanese subway, it's just dead silence. You know, no one's talking loudly in front of each other and things like that. So I I guess that reservation Mm -hmm. that they normally have has something to do with this thrill of seeing them just kind of degraded and then being wanton, sadomasochistic. (laughs) Hey, I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. So I'm not yucking the yum. Okay, I mean, this is all fantasy. It's only a movie. Um, believing that he has kind of brought Kyoshi and Kaoru down to their level, he unties them and stops binding them, and basically says, "Hey, you can stay with us. You can leave. He doesn't care. I don't care what you do." Yeah, they're like all having dinner together, and they're back in their nice clothes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they start having these like out in the woods sessions, Mm -hmm. which that's the thing I just want to talk about is this location, the woods and like the forest around this cabin. Like it's very gorgeous. And there'll Mm -hmm. be these great moments where like something's going on and it's like really, really degrading. And you're like, Ooh, I don't know how I feel about this. And then the camera will just like cut or fucking pan over this great. And it's the most like lush, verdant green landscapes you've ever seen. And the river running through it. And right. It's so gorgeous. But I think again, talking about the whole, um, like using the kimono in the beginning and the flower arranging, all the traditional Japanese stuff, Uh, this sort of um, perverse action would have to happen in the primal forest. Mm. This can't happen in the modern Japanese town. Oh, brought your A-game today. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It it has to happen out here in the wild. Yeah, I actually like that. That's that's cool. Uh, So, yeah, they're having a little romp in the woods, Kunisada and Akiko, and they return and find the lovers... Somehow they have bound them to each other. Each Yeah. It's like the elaborate like torture binding that he's been doing, but they did it to themselves. Yeah. And they affixed it in a way to where like they had their necks bound. Right. And at the same time, like one could pull and it would choke the other and like a counter force. Yeah. So and, they, they have they have choked each other whilst tied together. And done a sort of wild double suicide. Yeah. Again, I mean, suicide's also been sort of a preoccupation throughout Japanese history, too, mm-hmm. for various reasons that, I don't know. Save that for a different movie yeah, on yeah, a different day. Right. Um, but it's funny because Kunisada is kind of shocked at this because he thought he had them all figured out. And Akiko actually teases him and she says, well, it looks like they've played the final joke on you. Yeah, yeah. And she starts laughing at him. And it's, it sounds like she's approaching madness here with this yeah. laughter, too. And you can see there's already starting to be like a shift in the dynamic between the two of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then she begs Kunisada to tie her up more and abuse her. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, we get one of our classic pink film throw-ins. <laughs> the hapless detectives trying to find <laughs> what's going on. The people perpetrating these crimes. And... Oh, wait. There was another plot going on. Okay. Yeah, they are following Miko, the little girl from the beginning, who was just happily skipping through the forest mm-hmm. she's going over this wooden bridge we saw before and they're kind of hiding trailing, trailing her thinking that they're going to lead <laughs> they're using this little girl to, to lead them back to Kunisada <laughs> oh this man who captured you and assaulted you go find him again um, well there's no implication that they've put her up to this either I think I think it's implied I kind of just got the vibe that they saw her and were like where the fuck's she going but shouldn't and, she and then... like be still like Reunited with her family, or at the very least, in some sort of protective services it's been three, type thing. I don't know. It's been three years, you know. Well, that wasn't three years. That happened at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, at the beginning of the movie, and then it jumps three years. I thought was kind of what happened there. I don't think so. That was the implication I got. I thought they were just talking about three years ago. Mm. I don't think there was a time jump because Miko is the same little girl. True. I guess that wouldn't change, would it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's neither here nor there because we never find out uh, what their intentions are or really 
really anything about these detectives. No, because, she, well, she gives them the slip. She, she, this, this little girl has to piss a lot. She begins urinating, and they kind of look away, mm-hmm. you know, because they're not perverts like Kunisada. Right. Uh, but whilst they're looking away, she disappears. It was a ruse. She's smart. Mm-hmm. Which I guess would imply that she knows they're there. Yes. Which supports your theory. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm coming around to it. See? Okay. Someone paid attention while they were watching this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we see which one of us paid a little too much attention. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. <laughs> um, so the cops go looking after her. Um, which there's a great fuck again like for no reason they have amazing cinematography shots where we get a wide shot of the full length of the bridge and them just storming across it yeah in pursuit right very cool looking they don't find her but they do find the old abandoned house they do and they find Akiko which is all tied up and they're running over to she, her just kind of just writhing in the floor yeah yeah and they find the dead couple they're still there and one of them goes to Akiko and she says don't untie me I like it this way <laughs> yes <laughs> They're asking where Kunisada is, mm-hmm. and she says that he escaped. And she thinks it's funny because she she thinks that he's afraid of her. Yeah, and that's I why guess he fled. she's a woman now. Mm-hmm. You know. And then we get the ending credit roll kicks in with another gorgeous shot. Mm-hmm. And I thought this was like totally interesting. So it's Kunisada. He's with Miko holding her hand, mm-hmm. and they're kind of walking down this mountain yeah. where the cabin's located. But in like the wide shot, you can see this actually isn't that far from the city. Right. It's kind of just a mountain right on the edge of town, and they're just up a little yeah, ways. It's kind of down in a valley. Um, and I kind of thought that was like a poignant thing of like they are in this retreated space, but yet it is still so close right. to the city. Yeah. And what's acceptable. And... Mm-hmm. But it's like right there, just kind of on the edge of it, just, mm-hmm. just out of sight in a way. Right. Yeah, they seem pretty happy to be reunited, and they, mm-hmm. they go walking off to the town. And then the very last shot is a shot of Akiko tied up and squirming in the cabin still. Yep. The end. And everyone lives happily ever after. <laughs> it's the uh, implications of this ending are like horrifying. A nice tight 71 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sick fucker. <laughs> hey, you said you wanted shorter films, so. <laughs> um... I did. Before we debate the merits of this, I've got more notes. So Okay. Uh, let's see. This is going to be all you, man. I yeah. found a few things, but I'm sure you've already got them. Um, so, of course, we had talked about how um, this has a very high reputation. It, it, it grossed very well. It reviewed very well. And I pulled some of that just so we can see what critical minds thought about it. Okay. Um, any general consensus, uh, a lot of people who would claim to be fans of this Roman porno series hold this up as one of the best. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle said of it, it's like watching a sexual madhouse. <laughs> However, the Chicago Tribune called it artistically poetic. Um, we've mentioned the Weissers a few times, very famous film critics, yes. Thomas and Yuko. In their book, Japanese Cinema Encyclopedia of the Sex Films, they wrote this about it. Uh, the early Sato films of Masaru Kanuma are well-scripted, stylishly directed, and singularly harrowing. Of them, this one is easily the best. Arguable. Some some fair points. <clears throat> um, another film critic, Ray Ranaletta, called this film a groundbreaking film that rises above a simple geek show mentality and presents its sadomasochistic themes in uncompromising terms, forcing the viewer to deal with the film on a rational, objective level while at the same time reveling in sheer sexual outrageousness. Hmm. I tend to agree with that as well. Okay. And then, um, Jason, you do love your movie books. I do. And uh, do you know the old Scarecrow video movie guide? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Never owned it, but I am familiar. Um, They have an entry on it, and they say, This is a shockingly graceful film, beautifully shot and lovingly realized by Konuma, lending a dreamlike quality to the whole affair. Mm. Pretty cool. Um, and then this is maybe like the most interesting nugget of information. <laughs> God damn it, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm leaving this like, in too. Like, like that beautiful woman's <laughs> turn. Oh, we're not even done talking about that either. That's the uh, funny part. In 1998, as an effort to introduce the many wonders of Japanese film to Americans, and particularly the pink film subgenre, 
Phaedrus Cinema released Wife to be Sacrificed theatrically in the U.S. on a double bill with Noboru Tanaka's A Woman Called Sada Abe. Yeah, this, is, this is over 20 years later. Yeah. It premiered in San Francisco in June, opening to very favorable reviews. Uh, beginning October 30th, 1998, it played for a week at the Monica Fourplex Theater in Los Angeles. Uh, despite the age of the film and the historical context of, you know, the whole pink film boom that happened and all, all the history there, it proved too controversial for some American critics. Uh, some critics that were invited from the Los Angeles time left the theater in disgust after only 20 minutes of the film. I can see that. Uh, Phaedra founder Gregory Hadanaka commented, most people just don't understand the historical value of the films. If people walked in and were expecting sex and zen, well, they're obviously not going to understand it. These are dark films and very serious. And yes, the shock value is a part of their appeal. Indeed. There you go. They did not know their limits, those critics. Right. They didn't take our <laughs> advice. Um, this did get a U.S. release. Um, it was licensed by a little thing called Kim Stem Entertainment. I think they've been around a while. They've licensed a lot of Asian films. Uh, they partnered with Image Entertainment to give it a DVD release in 2003. Uh, it presented the film in the original Japanese language uh, without removable subtitles. They were burned into the film. Hmm. Um, and it was non-anamorphic widescreen format. It got a kind of brushed up re-release in 2005 that fixed a few of those things. It made removable subtitles, uh, fully anamorphic format, and they just threw in a ton of extras on the disc. And notably was that Hideo Nakata documentary from 2001. Uh, the name of it was Sadistic and Masochistic. The funny thing is, the documentary is 91 minutes, so it's actually longer than Wife to be Sacrificed. Yeah, most of those movies. Um, and it was mostly kind of a biographical overview of Konuma's you know, career in film, but also had a series of meetings and interviews where they would take Konuma, they would go get someone that worked with him on one of his films, sit them down, let them talk again for the first time in forever, and kind of just reminisce about working on the movie. And the big centerpiece they build up to is he has a reunion with Naomi Tani, and they sit down in a theater to watch Wife to be Sacrificed and then go to a restaurant uh, to eat and talk it over. Mm -hmm. And so when they're... Oh, no, no, no. They're, they're at like a place to eat, and they're showing the film for them. That's what it is. My notes are a little jumbled here. But so it, we get to the outhouse scene, the infamous moment. Yes. <laughs> and they're kind of talking back and forth about it, and they sort of stop. And then Konuma looks down at his dish and he looks to Tani and kind of smirks and she kind of smirks. And then he says, I really shouldn't have ordered the curry, should I? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, and then last little bit of notes here. So um, as far as like where this is today, there, it's out of print. Um, actually, the version you and I watched, Jason, that's out there on the, uh, the old uh, Seven Seas, as it might be, is a rip of the DVD. Okay. I noticed the Kim Stem logo yeah. at the start. Right. Um, so Image Entertainment still exists today. They're now RLJE Entertainment, which okay. we know and love, and yeah. they they also license a lot of Asian cinema. Um, but I don't know. I couldn't track down like where the rights are for this. Does Kim Stem still have it or who? Mm -hmm. Um, man, it needs a Blu-ray though, don't you think? <laughs> Especially with that documentary too. Well, the documentary, I'm sure, yeah. is very interesting. Um, obviously, Impulse's Nakatsu collection would be like the golden place for it. But again, it's like a rights thing. Who knows who yeah. has the control of it right now? Right. Um, but Why I, the accuser? it's overdue. <laughs> um, and then last little thing, some more little connections, because there were a lot of connections here. We got the flower and snake stuff. Um, but also, this was just a little passing thing. One of the films I talked about last year was A Haunted Turkish Bathhouse. It got a Blu-ray release uh, from Mondo Macabro. Mm. Crazy fucking film. Super fun. And not only does that star Naomi Tani in a little role, but it also features Terumi Azuma, who plays Kaoru here. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a reunion for the two of them. But then also... Um... Let me find it. Oh, crap. Where was it? Oh, so this was written by Yozo Tanaka. He worked with Atsushi Yamatoya, who made Inflatable Sex to All the Wastelands, on several films by Seijun Suzuki, also quite a champion of. 
And then uh, Masaru Mori, who we already talked about, the cinematographer, not only did he shoot Star of David, he also did several other prominent pink films and related things. Uh, he did one of the Angel Guts films. Ah. Um, he shot a woman called Sada Abe, which they mm. ran up in that double feature. Um, he did another of the Roman pornos that's super well-known called Assault, Jack the Ripper. Okay. And um, he directed the follow-up to Zoom In Rape Site, the maybe not so interestingly named Zoom In Rape Apartments. <laughs> okay. So yeah, lots of uh, threaded pieces that connect to other stuff we've talked about or been interested in. Interesting. Which was another reason I selected it. Now, since I did pick this, should I should I fire off first yeah, yeah, about you, it? You go first. <clears throat> okay. Um. So I feel like this one, like, it has such an interesting tone to it, because it is it is more serious than Flower and Snake. But there are those moments where it's like they're kind of winking at you a little bit. Yeah. And, and wanting you to laugh, even. It's hard to take it too serious. It's like they want you to laugh, but they also want you to feel bad for laughing, at the same time. Um. And I would say, like, after I watched this, I think this movie was how, in my mind, I always thought Flower and Snake was going to be. Okay. Because I, if you remember when we talked about that film, I talked about how I had that reputation of, like, oh, it's so it's so crazy and mm-hmm. all, all the BDSM elements and stuff, and it's so, it's so like, harrowing to watch. Right. And then when we watched it, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think this was, like, what in my mind I conceived Flower and Snake to be. Yeah. Um, where it is more serious and it is more like dealing with darker themes and stuff. Um, but I mean, there is that sense of humor. I don't see how you can have that music swell and you're not meaning for people to laugh about that. Right. Um, and while the plot is pretty scant, I think that's true for a lot of pink films and they're kind of just playing to their formula, which is fine. But I do feel like there's some neat ideas in the mix here besides just the general, like exploring of BDSM ideas I think the ending and kind of the direction for Akiko really sets up something that's like, hmm, really leaves you to think about it after it's over. Um, so it feels like with Kunisada, for him, everything is just about control and power. Mm-hmm. And who knows if we had more backstory on him. Maybe there's a reason for that. doesn't really matter. He's just a terrible fucker. But, um, mm-hmm. but really, like, his whole angle is that he wants to have control over Akiko and he wants to ruin her in return for you know, having turned him into the police and everything else. And he, he gets off on that control and that power that he has. Um, but as Akiko came to kind of realize, like, you know, there are elements about this that I do enjoy and kind of just playing that role of the victim. But because she's choosing to play it, it's no longer just being forced upon her. It kind of empowers her almost in a sense where she, even though it looks like she has no control, she actually has quite a bit of control. Right. And over the course of the film, and I think it's really the death of the, 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 two, the two lovers there that kind of flips it, she starts to have the power over him. And in turn, he has, like, lost control. Mm-hmm. Which, again, she kind of, like, sums up right there at the end. She says, I think he's afraid of me. Right. Which echoes back to their conversation in the graveyard. Oh, he's afraid of women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's kind of like a really powerful moment in a way where it's like he did put her through all this shit, but not only did she endure it, which again props to her for shooting these scenes and even oh, yeah. going I mean, through everything. Girls were broke. Yeah, uh, she totally sells that hundred percent. But at the end, she overcomes and surpasses Kunisada, and all he can do is just run away and flee on onto whatever next perversion to to hide in. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was like really poignant in a way to close out the film. Um, cinematography is gorgeous really has no right looking as good as it does in some of the shots, uh, especially a lot of the nature scenes and just the wide shots. Yeah. Um, inter- on the pink film front, interesting use of some of the blocking for the sex scenes, sure. the way they kind of mask and hide stuff. Yeah. Uh, really remembered that candle scene. And then I think <laughs> it's, it's maybe one of the times they're having sex in the woods. They kind of just have like a little twig jutting off right. a tree yeah, it's very and, that's, precise. and that's the only thing very precisely posed uh-huh. to block the shot yeah very clever um music's not really that memorable but except uh, for that one scene except for the one scene which that fucking slays <laughs> um acting is great across the board everyone brings their a game um can't deny how amazing naomi tani is no uh she literally steals the show probably in just about anything she turns up in mm-hmm. um 
Yeah, another hit by Konuma for me. Okay. Um, I, in the end, decided to rate this one slightly higher than Flower and Snake and gave it a four. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'm less favorable toward this movie. Mm. Um, I think my issue is, I, I agree that it does look nice. Mm-hmm. Um, the actors are all totally committed. Um, it's actually amazing how how committed some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it makes you wonder like it does blur that line it's like mm. how much are they enjoying this mm. versus how much are they just really good actors you know mm-hmm. and that's part of that illusion it's, it's part of the whole illusion that we um, it's that uh, unspoken agreement right that, that you have when you engage well, any any piece of fiction really but especially like you know, pornography in any way. Right. Because it's not real. Mm-hmm. There's nothing real about any of it. Even if the actual act is real, like it's unsimulated or whatever, mm-hmm. it's still performance. Right. Because we don't see all the times they shout cut and then yeah. like reset up the scene. Right. And... Right. Or how bored the people really are and they just got to <laughs> fucking fake it, you know. Um, True. So the props to them for selling it. That's for sure. Um, I, I think it's a little light on plot and that bothers me. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like, okay, it's sort of the same thing over and over. And Even in the realm of pink films, it is, I would yeah. say, on the lighter side it's of that. It's very basic. And it is one of the earlier ones. So I guess you can forgive it a little bit. But I mean, after Zoom Up, Murder Sight, which had a great story yeah. and, and everything was like firing on all cylinders on that one. I don't think any, I don't think anyone you can show me is going to match how much I like that one. Cause it's a good movie. That one's surprisingly incredible. It's a good movie. Full stop. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I think your enjoyment of this movie hinges completely on how much you like the Pinku genre. Yeah. You know, if you're into that, you'll you'll probably dig it. If it's not really your thing, you're probably going to find it a little tedious and <sighs> weird. Because if you're looking if you're looking <laughs> for titillation, unless you have very specific fetishes, this isn't it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not. Agreed. Your, yeah. Um, and if you're looking for that sort of, if you have that sort of fetish, maybe it doesn't go far enough. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Um. But, I mean, it obviously tapped into something. Because, like you said, it was very successful. Yeah. And this is the days before video. This was shown in theaters, mm-hmm. you know. And there's definitely something to be said for, like, the shock value and the envelope pushing. Right, right. Which I'm always, you know, a fan of. I like, <laughs> you know, making people uncomfortable is sometimes necessary when you're making art. Sometimes you just need to sit down and <laughs> make some uh, prop feces, you know. Sometimes. Um, but at the end of the day... I, I don't think too much of the movie. I got to give it a two and a half. Okay. You well. know, I mean, it's, it's, it is short. Um, but there's, a, <laughs> there's enough what the fuckery going on. That it, it keeps it interesting. You know, that's fair. I think. Yeah. I won't begrudge you your opinion. <laughs> and I, I think after seeing a few of these, it's, it's not my genre. It's not something I'm going to mm-hmm. seek out and watch mm-hmm. unless it's as good as the first zoom up because I love the story in that. Well, I'm gonna keep chasing that dragon. Yeah, and keep, okay. When I find the ones that hit like that, I'll let me know when you do. I'll filter watch, them your I'll way. Watch that. Uh, so I think you know if this movie is for you or not. Yeah. This is something you should check out. I think when we announced we were doing it, if you were like, "Oh, <laughs> right," right then, right, then yes, this movie is for you. And if you were like, "Oh God, why the fuck are they doing another one of these?" <laughs> um, yeah, you probably should just skip this one. Blame Dustin. Um, yeah. So that's my thoughts. Cool. Well, we had a good discussion, I think. Yeah. I had fun. Yeah. Uh, fun watching this, fun discussing it with you, laughing about it, getting into some of the ideas with it. It's pretty goofy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the next movie we've chosen is going to be a uh, listener suggestion. Yes, it is, as is our new rotation we're doing. So, uh, Jason, you dug into the vault there, and what have you uncovered for us? Oh, um, let me make it back to the page oh my god well i hang on i didn't I have to tie you up in the corner <laughs> <laughs> oh no please don't um hey jason happy valentine's day <laughs> I, I can't even get through it <laughs> ah from a suggestion from john It is a movie, a TV film, so it's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Your wheelhouse, yeah. I love old From TV. my wheelhouse 
to your world. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a movie called um, A Code Night's Death from 1973. Well, I like that title. So A Code Night's Death is about two scientists suspect that there is someone other than their research primates inhabiting their polar station. I had to reread that word. <laughs> research primates. Uh-huh. Wow. Huh. Oh my God. It's like an Arctic movie. It's like a um, close quarters, you know, constricted one area type movie, like a bottleneck episode. And it's a monkey movie, apparently, mm. to some degree. Dude. It's going to be going up against Primal Rage, though, so I don't know. Well, we'll see. It stars Robert Culp. Okay. And Eli Wallach. Two great, solid. Sure. Some of your dad's favorite actors. <laughs> Well, Eli Wallach was Tuco in The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Oh, yeah. Amongst other things. And Robert Culp is uh, Robert Culp. I always remember him from um, um, Greatest American Hero. Hey, he's apparently an extra three Watch the Skies. <laughs> so not the first one, the good one. Mm, uh, no. Okay, so this movie, uh, you're going to have to go to YouTube for this one. Mm. There's no proper release for it, right? Right. It's a it's plague for many TV movies. Yeah, and it's going to look like shit because it's a TV movie from the 70s. That hasn't been remastered or anything. So, but, so is this the secret theme? Because mine was a DVD rip, and now you're going with a TV. I think so. Yes. TV movie. Yes. But if you dig TV movies like I do, especially from that great era of the seventies, I think it's supposed to be a pretty good one. From what little I've read of it, I don't want to spoil myself. Okay. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. But that does bring us to the end of the episode, and we hope that you've had an enjoyable Valentine's Day this year. I think this is the first time we've tried to do a targeted Valentine's Day episode. Uh, Let us know what you think of that. Let us know how it goes. Do I need to be banned from pitching more uh, Roman pornos for a while? Uh, We're always open to feedback, and you can hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can email us at genreexposure at gmail.com. We will be very excited. Let us know if you watched this movie with your uh, significant other, and let us know how that went. And if you got dumped, we will buy you a month of some dating service <laughs> in return. That's that's the genre exposure guarantee. I'm putting it down right now. <laughs> oh, you've been listening to Genre Exposure. Bye, everyone. Take care. listening to the prescribed films podcast network home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment the shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media the pfpn hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com thanks for listening